Good evening, my name is Katherine Matthews and I'm the Director of Education at Old North Church and Historic Site. Please note that as you just heard, tonight's program is being recorded. So if you do not wish to be in the recording, just shut off your video and, and listen. Uh, additionally, we do ask that you keep yourself on mute until the Q&A when we hope that we will 100% be joining in the conversation. As we begin, let us take time to acknowledge those who came before us and whose stories may not be widely known. At the Old North Foundation, we work every day to deepen our knowledge of our past and to share our history with honesty and respect for those who came before us. Part of that history is the story of the land and its guardians. Old North site was once the traditional territory of the Massachusetts people. By 1723, when Old North Church was founded, the Massachusetts communities in the area had already been decimated by disease and warfare, trafficked into enslavement, removed from their homes, and forced to assimilate into European culture. Despite this devastating reality, the Massachusetts people survived, and their descendants carry on the knowledge and traditions of their ancestors. Their story is part of our shared American story. So thank you for being with us for tonight's event. Kathleen Waldvogel will be sharing the story of discovery and research that culminated in her book, Spies, Soldiers, Couriers and Saboteurs, Women of the American Revolution. Hers was a six year project of exploring lesser known stories that are part of our shared history and writing a book that presents these biographical episodes in ways designed to appeal to younger audiences. And yet, the courage and active citizenship we see displayed by these women and teenagers serves as a vivid reminder of the many ways that one can be called to support one's community and to shape its future. Not all of these women are well known, but Kathleen's book allows for them to be remembered and celebrated as they inspire a new generation of history lovers. Now it is my honor and pleasure to introduce Kathleen. She is a children's book author and a former teacher. After retiring from teaching, her passion for history led her to begin researching early American history and especially the years leading up to and including the American Revolution. She found herself focusing on the stories of women and this book is the product of that research. So let's get started. Thank you. I'm so excited to be here and I am so excited to tell you about some of these women. Um, as explained, I tried to focus in on some of the little known women of that period of time, women who stepped out of the comfort of their homes and just decided, you know what, I, I need to take an active role in helping the, the patriots uh, defeat the British. And so I am excited to be able to do that. And I thought I would start with uh, discussing what the role of women was during this time and how it changed over time. And as I do that, I'm going to be interjecting some of the stories of the women that are featured in my book because they fit into these different roles. And you'll see how they had to make well, changes this, this in their really lives weird. In, order to, um, in order to survive. So we're gonna start with uh, the roles of women of the American Revolution. And it started out rather traditional roles because <clears throat> women initially in this, in this uh, time period were considered to be very genteel. They couldn't possibly understand the strategies of war. They couldn't possibly understand the finances of running a business. They were expected to simply run a household and to take care of the children. And so that was their, their focus. And the, may, the men, uh, normally the, the oldest male in the family was the patriarch. And he took care of running the family businesses and running the family farms. He took care of all of the finances. Well, when the war started and many of the men went off to battle, women's responsibilities certainly changed. Um, they had an option of staying and taking care of the family farms if they were able to do that. Or they could uh, make the decision to follow the men into battle. But if they left their property, 
they kind of risked the idea that the property would become run down or that the business would, would fail. And so many of the women decide to stay, but they had to have the finances in order to do that. And they had to have the wherewithal to then take a step further and take care of the day-to-day -day operations of the businesses, of the farms and that type of thing. And the women who stayed and took care of the property were considered to be non-combatant. And so very seldom were they harassed by the British or the, the loyalist neighbors because it was understood that they were there simply to take care of the property and make sure that um, this was held intact for when the men returned. <clears throat> but they also had to have the skills to be able to take care of the property. So for I'm going to give you an example of a couple of the women in my book. Uh, one of them was Martha Bratton. And Martha and her husband lived in South Carolina. They owned a large farmer plantation. And when her husband was joining up with the Patriots, Martha took it upon herself then to learn what the role was or learn to oversee the operations of their farm or their plantation. So that meant that she had to oversee the hired help that were there, the laborers that were there, understand when the harvest was going to be taking place, uh, how she would go about doing that. But she stayed on the farm and she was absolutely determined that when her husband returned, that there would be something for him to return to. And so she would be an example of one of the women that, that just felt that, you know what, I can take this step, I can do this. Um, there is a lot of work involved in it. I'm taking care of my children, but I'm also taking care of the future of our family. Another woman that decided to stay on the property was Anna Smith Strong. And Anna lived in Setauket, New York. Well, Anna's husband was a Patriot judge and he was imprisoned by the British for being a traitor because he was a Patriot and he believed that the Patriots had every right to rebel against uh, the King and, and the uh, representation that they did not have. So he was imprisoned in a British uh, prisoner of warship. And during that time, the conditions on that ship were terrible. Anna was not allowed to see him for many months. And she was finally able to convince her relatives who were loyalists, they intervened on her behalf that she could visit him. And at that point, Sela, her husband, had almost died from malnutrition. Well, it was because of Anna bringing food to him on that ship that he was able to survive. And her loyalist relatives were able to secure for him a, a pardon of some sorts. He was allowed to leave the prison ship, but he was exiled to Connecticut. So he couldn't have anything further to do with the war. But Anna decided to stay on the ancestral estate so that uh, the property would be theirs when the war was over with and she could maintain it or see what was going on. But she had to have the finances to do that. Well, when Sela was exiled to Connecticut, Anna also sent their young children to Connecticut to get out of harm's way. So she was on the property that was actually taken over by the British through the Quartering Act. So they took over the main house and she lived among the British. She was in one of the outbuildings or one of the uh, smaller houses that were, were on the property. But every day she had to mingle among the British and see them and see what they were doing to her property. But these were examples of women who were able to stay on their property. And not all women were able to do that because not all women had the finances to do that and not all women had the skills to do that. So here you can see that they stayed to protect their property. Uh, they learned to manage the hired hands that were on the farms. They learned the day-to-day -day operations. So their, their role is starting to evolve, is starting to change. And they had to understand what the finances were for the businesses and for the farms as well. But for the women who could not afford to do that, many of them became camp followers. And these were wives or daughters who followed the husbands or their fathers or sons. Um, into battle, actually. They, they went with, with the camps as well, but they were not able to support themselves or tend to their home or tend to their businesses. They didn't have the skills to do that. So they were looking for, well, what am I going to do now? And to them, the logical thing was that they were going to be following their men. But resources for the, the Continental Army were very scarce. 
And so in order for the camp followers to be allowed to continue to be there, they had to prove their worth and they had to prove that they would be a benefit to the army, to the soldiers or, or to the officers who were there. So they had to pull their weight, in other words. And General Washington made it very clear that if they couldn't do that, they, they simply couldn't stay. There would be no rations for them because there wasn't anything that they could share with them. Like I said, the resources were very scarce, the food, the uh, um, blankets, the clothing, that type of thing. And so they couldn't afford to just have anyone follow along. So some of these camp followers then had to take on specific roles that would be beneficial to the army. So certainly <clears throat> cooks were beneficial to the army. They were preparing the meals, but along with that, women were expected to forage for food. Now, depending on what the time of year was, they could manage to find some food in the wild, things that were growing wild, different greens or different berries, and they could use that. But then they also had to barter with um, some of the local farmers trying to get food enough that that would be helpful for the army. And then they were expected to prepare the meals. And in, in payment for this, they were allowed rations as well, but they were not allowed the full rations of the, the uh, soldiers at that time. Some women took on the role of being seamstresses or laundresses, and certainly the sewing of the uniforms and the socks and those types of things would be beneficial to the soldiers. But clean clothing was also something that, that was desirable because if you're able to have clean clothing, you're able to have clean bedding, that would reduce the amount of disease that would be spread during this time. So it would curtail the, the disease. And certainly that was beneficial to the army if the women were able to do this. Uh, some women then were also nurses. And while they did tend the sick and the wounded, they also did a lot of the custodial tasks. They emptied uh, bedpans. Um, they bathed and fed the infirmed or those for who, who were too poor or too um, ill to be able to do that for themselves. And so they tended the sick and they tended the wounded as they could, but then they also took care of a lot of the custodial tasks as well. Women also followed men onto the battlefield. And if you think about that, they're putting their own lives in danger when they're doing this. Yes, they're bringing water to the men during the sweltering heat. They're bringing water to cool down the cannons because um, they needed to do that in order to be able to continue to, to fire the cannons. But they're putting themselves at risk as they're doing that. And so two of the women that uh, I wanna tell you a little bit about. These are, are two women that I have featured in my book. Both of them are associated with the name of Molly Pitcher. And really Molly Pitcher was um, a mixture of all of the different women, all the different camp followers who went out onto the battlefield and were bringing the water to the cannoneers and to the soldiers. But the two women that I wanted to tell you about that I have in my book were Mary Ludwig Hayes and Margaret Corbin. And what I found interesting about both of these women is that they were camp followers. They had been helping out by, by being cooks, but they also went onto the battlefield and they were bringing the, the water to the men. But both of these women, their husbands worked on the cannons and both of them saw their husbands collapse. And as a result, then these women both took over the duties of the husbands at the cannon. In the case of Mary Ludwig Hayes, her husband was not fatally wounded, but he was not able to continue with his duties. So Mary took over and she was helping with the cannons. At that time, she was actually lifting the cannonballs and giving it to the next, um, to the man in line then to, to load up the cannon. And as she was doing this, she was actually fired upon by the enemy and a cannonball went between her legs. Her legs were straddled at the time and took out her petticoat. She was not injured, but it ripped away her petticoat. And she just made a comment about, whoo, huh, glad it wasn't a little bit higher than that. And she just continued to do her work. And this particular episode was noted by one of the soldiers that was there who witnessed it. He wrote it in his journal. His name was Joseph Plum Martin. And he went on and on about the fact that she just continued working, even though she had nearly, she narrowly 
escaped being hit by this cannonball herself. And he was, he admired her courage for doing that. Um, the other woman that, and Mary did receive an annual pension after that. Um, she didn't receive the pension until 1822. And she received the annual uh, pension of $40, which was the same as any of the soldiers received at that time. Um, the other woman, Margaret Corbin, was bringing water to the men on the field and she saw her husband hit and he was fatally wounded. Now, Margaret had watched the men as they had been practicing these different roles at the cannon and she knew her husband's job. He was actually in charge of firing the cannon. So she knew what to do. She took over his role and she was actually quite accurate with her, uh, her firing to the point that it attracted the attention of the British and they started firing on her. Uh, she was wounded. Um, they actually thought that she was going to die from her wounds. She did not, she recovered, but she lost the use of her left arm. It never, um, she was never able to recover from that. And eventually she also received a pension, but that again, took a while for that to happen. Uh, so these were some of the conventional roles that the camp followers had. There were cooks, they were laundresses, uh, seamstresses, there were nurses, and they followed the men onto the battlefield and helped wherever they could. But there were also some non-traditional roles that, that women had in the American Revolution as well. And I had mentioned earlier that women were considered to be very genteel. They couldn't possibly understand the strategies of war. They couldn't possibly understand the finances and things like that that were going on. Well, because of these misconceptions, uh, women were actually privy to a lot of information. So a lot of British officers, as well as American officers, spoke very freely in front of women because they thought that um, they couldn't possibly know what's going on. So it didn't matter if they spoke in front of them. So they talked about troop movements. They talked about shipments of supplies. Uh, they talked about when reinforcements would come. And several women kept track of this information and then passed the information on to uh, the Patriot camps. And one of them was a woman by the name of Molly Rinker. And she lived in the Philadelphia, she lived in Philadelphia actually. And Molly had she had um, a habit of going up onto a ridge and knitting. So she would take her linens out, she would go up to the Wissahickon Ridge and she'd lay out her linens to uh, bleach in the sun. And then she'd sit there and she would knit. And when she was up on that ridge, she had a great view. She could see the British camp that was there. She could see the troops that were coming in. She could see when they were preparing to leave. She could see when shipments of supplies came in. Now she could also be seen by others and she never quite knew who was watching her. But along with her trips up to the ridge, she also worked in a tavern that was frequented by British officers. And Molly being the clever woman that she was and realizing that um, they spoke very freely about their plans would catch bits and pieces of information and she would realized that when she was looking at the troop movements and she was looking at these different things, that they would kind of coincide with what she was hearing in the tavern. And so at night, she would write down any information that she had. She'd uh, wrap this note in a little over a stone and then wrap yarn around it. So when she would go on her knitting excursion, she would have this, these balls of yarn along with others you know, that she was actually using. So if she was ever stopped by soldiers and they examined the tote that she had, nothing would look suspicious because there's simply balls of yarn that were there. And then she would go up on the ridge and she would accidentally drop a ball of yarn over the ledge, you know, and she would admonish herself when she would do that, how clumsy she was, just in case anyone was watching. But she felt that that was an action that would not arouse much suspicion in any way. So um, when she would do this, the patriots also knew that 
that this is what she was doing. And a Patriot courier watched her. And when she would drop a ball of yarn over the edge, he would retrieve it and take it back to the Patriot camp. And in that way, she was able to get information to the Patriots in a very timely manner as to what was going on. So women managed to take the fact that they were underestimated and use it to their advantage quite a bit. Another spy was Anna Smith Strong, who I had mentioned earlier. And Anna was actually part of the culprit spy ring. The culprit spy ring reported directly to General Washington. And as I said, she lived in Setauket, New York, and she had a clear view of the Long Island Sound. She could see all of the ships that came in, all of the boats that came into the Sound. And on the other side of her property, uh, down the hill, was a number, another member of the Culper Spy Ring. His name was Abraham Woodhall. Abraham Woodhall was a cabbage farmer, and he's the one who recruited Anna to be a part of the spy ring. Now, remember that the British are occupying her property, and so she can't go down the hill to talk to Woodhall anytime she has information. So they had to come up with a way that she could relay information to him without arousing the British suspicions. Well, her role in the spy ring was to watch the Long Island Sound. And when a whale boat would come into the Sound, a particular whale boat that was owned by another member of the spy ring, his name was Caleb Brewster. When he would come into the Sound, she was supposed to signal Abraham Woodhall because Brewster was who Woodhall would make contact with to exchange information. But of course, there's a lot of different coves in that sound. And so she, they had to come up with a way that Anna could not only signal Woodhall, but also tell him where was Brewster, where was he holed up at? So what they came up with was Anna would do her laundry. And when she would see Caleb Brewster in the Long Island Sound, she would hang up a black petticoat. That was the signal that Brewster is there. But in order for her to transfer the information about what cove was he in or where was he, uh, she and Woodhall had assigned a number to the different coves that were there. I think that there were six. And so her way of relaying this information was that she would use shorter pieces of clothing, such as handkerchiefs. She would put them on the, the clothesline and she would intersperse them with her other clothing that was up there. But because they were much shorter, Woodhall could easily see from his property how many of them there were on the line. And so if Brewster was in cove number four, she would put up four handkerchiefs. If he was in cove number two, she would hang up two handkerchiefs. And that way, Anna and Woodhall did not have to have face-to-face -face meetings at all, because remember, the British are right there. And he would still receive the information and be able to meet up with with Brewster. And the Culper spy ring was uh, a very successful spy ring. They were the ones who uncovered Benedict Arnold's plot to turn over West Point to the British. So they were very successful in what they did. They were not actually, the, the members were not actually discovered um, their identities until uh, sometime in the 19, early 1900s when um, one of the ancestors came across uh, the information. Um, along with being spies, some women took a very active role by wanting to physically fight in the battles. But women were not allowed to join the, the army. In fact, if they tried to do that, they were subject to harassment. They were subject to being jailed. So they had to disguise themselves as men if they were going to be successful. And I know that there were others who did this, but I have examples of two of them in my book that I'll tell you about. But they fought alongside the men in the battles and they had to keep their identity secret because they could be thrown out of the army and actually jailed if they were discovered. But one of them was Anna Maria Lane and Anna Maria was actually a camp follower. And so she helped in the camps with the, the cooking and she actually helped with some of the nursing as well. But <clears throat> she was also, a very good shot. And when her husband would go to battle at different times, 
um, Anna Maria would disguise herself in his clothing and she would march along with him and with his militia or with his unit. And she'd keep the, the hat down and that type of thing. And so she was uh, successful several times, but they finally went to uh, the Battle of Germantown and there was a heated battle going on. There was all kinds of chaos at that time. The, the Patriots did not have their they did not have the plan set up, the plan did not go as they had hoped. So different troops or different units showed up at different times and it was very chaotic. Well, Anna Maria was um, wounded in the upper thigh and her husband dragged her away from there and wanted to take her to the doctor and she refused because she said, um, if she were discovered, she would be in trouble, but so would her husband and she did not want that to happen. So she convinced her husband to extract the musket ball from her thigh. And um, if you can imagine these primitive conditions and not having anything to, any type of anesthetic at all uh, to help with that. But he did manage to get the musket ball out of that, but her leg wound never fully healed. And so as a result, she, she walked with a limp for the rest of her life. Now she was asked after the war, she was working in a hospital and a doctor asked her how she what happened that she received this limp and see so she figured you know the war is over with i'm not going to get anybody in trouble now so she said i fought in battles and i was wounded and so she explained that she was at the battle of germantown that uh, she had been wounded by the enemy and that she didn't feel that she could put her husband or herself at jeopardy by seeking medical attention at that time so her husband removed this this musket ball from her but it never really healed correctly. Well, the doctor was so taken by what she had said that he went to Congress and petitioned. He advocated for her that she needed to receive a soldier's pension because of what she had gone through. And eventually, Congress agreed and actually awarded her a pension of $100 a year, which was two and a half times what the male soldiers had received but she only lived two years after that to uh, be able to receive that pension. Um, along with Anna Maria Lane, another woman who felt the, the desire or the need to fight, you know, take an active role on the battlefield was Deborah Sampson. And Deborah was from Massachusetts. Deborah had um, been an indentured service she had, servant. She had worked on a farm and she was quite muscular. And then after her servitude was, was up, she was a teacher for a time, but she really felt that she should be a part of the army, the Continental Army. And she felt that she, she would be a benefit that way because she could fight and she could fire a weapon. So she dressed in men's clothing, she cut her hair and she went to the recruiter and tried to sign up at, under the name of Timothy Thayer. She was just signing the recruitment papers when one of her neighbors exposed her, said, I know who this is. This is not Timothy Thayer. This is Deborah Sampson. And when the recruiter found that out, he tore up the papers. He ordered her out of the, recruit, the recruitment uh, station and threatened that if she ever attempted anything like this again, she would be imprisoned. So she was totally humiliated. But after about a month or six weeks or so, she decided, you know what, I, I can do this. I can join the army. I know I can do this. So she tried again. This time she went to a neighboring community and she enlisted under the name of Robert Shirtliff. And this time she was successful. So she became Bobby or Robert Shirtliff. But she struggled to keep her gender a secret so she would bathe at night she would stay away from the other soldiers as much as possible but she did march along with them she carried the supplies just like they had to do she fought in battles alongside of them and for about a year and a half she kept her identity secret and then she was wounded at Tapanzi. Uh, she had initially been wounded in a, a head wound where a saber had struck her forehead but when her unit then, um, after that skirmish, her unit was, was resting at Tapanzi and they were ambushed by 
a group of Tories or a group of loyalists. And during that skirmish, she was wounded uh, with uh, a gunshot or a musket ball actually to her upper thigh. Well, her comrades took her to the doctor and she was uh, fighting against them doing this because she was afraid she would be discovered. And the doctor had just started examining her, was asking her about all of the blood on her. And she was insisting that it was just blood from, from her head wound and that it was blood from the men that, on the battlefield. But that was her only wound. And when the doctor was distracted by another soldier who was moaning, she, she took advantage of that. Deborah took advantage of that, grabbed a couple of supplies and she left the medical tent and then she performed self-surgery. She used a pen knife actually to remove the musket ball from her leg and then she sewed herself up. Now, because she did this self-surgery, again, her wound did not fully heal. And because she told the army that the only wound she had was the one that was to her head, she was declared physically fit or physically able now to join her unit again and to fight. And this was much sooner than she should have been able to do that. You know, she should have rested for several weeks after that. Um, but she went back and was with her unit. And then when her unit was assigned to uh, Philadelphia, there was an illness going around. There was a fever going around and Deborah fell ill because of this and she fainted. And again, her comrades took her to the doctor. And this time the, doc the doctor that was there, Dr. Binney did discover her secret and did realize that this was a woman. Uh, she begged him not to reveal this because she was concerned about being jailed, being imprisoned for, for what she had done. But the doctor went to her commanding officers and pleaded her case, said, you know, she was wounded defending defending other patriots, defending her, her fellow soldiers. And she should not be punished for that. And her commanding officers agreed with that. So they did actually discharge her honorably. And later on, she did receive a soldier's pension because of her efforts as a, a soldier in the Continental Army. So some women were spies, some were soldiers. And just like my the title of my book says, some were couriers or messengers, and they um, would rally men for different, for different needs that they had, or they were carrying messages from one patriot camp to another patriot camp. So a couple of the couriers or messengers that I had was, uh, one was Sybil Ludington. Now, Sybil's father was a colonel in the Continental Army, but it was also uh, part of the militia. And so men were home in April. This was April, I believe, of 1777. And uh, men were home because it was harvest time. And so her father was home. And late at night, it was a very rainy night. There was a knock on the door and a messenger was there saying that the British were on their way to Danbury, Connecticut. And that that is where the Patriots had some of their munitions stored. And so Colonel Ludington realized that he couldn't let these munitions fall into the hands of the British because they were going to be used against them. And so he wanted the courier then, or he wanted the messenger to continue and to muster some of the neighbors, have them come to the Ludington home so that they could confront the British in the morning. And the messenger said, I, I can't do it. I've just driven 25 miles or ridden 25 miles on my horse. I'm exhausted. We went through horrendous uh, downpours and mud and the horse is, is beat. And I don't know this countryside. I can't do this. So Sybil actually stepped forward. She's 16 years old and she said, I know the countryside, dad, and I can do this. Her, her father or her mother objected because it was quite dangerous. There were hostile uh, Native Americans in the area. Uh, there were outlaws in the area. There were Tories or loyalists that were roaming. And the mother totally objected to it because it was going to be too dangerous for her. But Sybil convinced her father that she would be able to do that. And so he mapped out a route for her, which was about, about 40 miles, I believe. And actually the route was farther than what Paul Revere had written when he was 
uh, mustering people as well, saying that the British were coming. But uh, Sybil went from house to house, delivering the message that you need to muster at the Ludingtons. The British are on their way to Danbury, Connecticut. Meet up with my father. He'll tell you what you have to do. And so she rode this 40 miles on her horse, Star. And again, it was a rainy, horrible night. But she got to her home in the morning, and over 400 men had gathered at the Ludington home. So she was quite successful in her, in her endeavors. Um, another courier or another messenger was Emily Geiger. Now, Emily was in South Carolina, and Emily's featured in my book as well. Emily lived in South Carolina with her father, and her father was infirmed, or her father was uh, disabled, and he was not able to, to uh, fight for the Americans, but he was very staunchly uh, leaning towards the Americans. Well, the father was friends with Nathaniel Green. And uh, General Green would often come to the Giger home and talk to his friend about what was going on with the, with the war. And <clears throat> one time when he went there, he was saying that he had heard word that the British were going to be leaving this fort, Fort Granby, because the commander, the British commander, just felt that it was too remote too far away from reinforcements. And so he was going to abandon the fort. But when he did this, he was going to split up his men. And so General Green felt that this would be the prime time for the Patriots then to confront the British when they left this fort and they were not at full capacity. But he wanted to get a message to General Thomas Sumter, who was about 70 miles away. And his dilemma was that in between General Green and General Sumter, there were the British and, and the Tories that were there. And so he couldn't send one of his men there because certainly his messenger would be intercepted. And he didn't know who he could trust with such an important message. And so Emily's father said that if he were able, he would certainly go. You know, he would deliver the message, but he was just not capable of doing that um, because of his disability. So Emily stepped forward and said she would do it. And General Green said, no, this was going to be too dangerous, but she convinced him. She said, first of all, I'm a woman. And so more than likely, this will not be a problem. I will not be suspected of anything because I am a woman. And the other thing is, is that my uncle lives not very far from where General Sumter is. And I have made that, that trip before. And so it's not unusual that I'd go visit my uncle. So I think that I can do this. Well, eventually General Green gave in and he gave Emily this message for General Sumter and stressed upon her how important it was that this message not fall into enemy hands. And she understood. So the first day of her trip, because this was a two day trip, was very uneventful. You know, she rode, she rode her horse. Uh, she encountered no one along the way. And then she spent the night at the home of relatives of a family friend of theirs. But these were loyalists. And Emily was very nervous that maybe she acted suspiciously. Maybe they would understand that she was doing more than just going to visit her uncle. And so early the next morning, she left um, this house. She left a note for them saying, oh, I want, I'm anxious to see my uncle. I'm concerned about him. And so she left the house. And so this day, she was not quite as lucky. She was intercepted by a British scout who thought that it was very suspicious that this 18-year-old girl was by herself. And of course, when you are in the safety of your home and you're saying, oh, I can do this because I'll just say this, it's not as intimidating as when someone is in your face and they're questioning you. And Emily was taken by surprise. She stammered, she stuttered. And so he was very suspicious of her and he took her to Fort Granby, which was the, the closest fort, the closest British fort there. And Lord Rowden was the commander of the, um, the British fort 
there and he also interviewed Emily and he also was suspicious. She kept saying, no, I'm going to visit my uncle. You know, I've done it before. He lives not far from, from here. I can tell you where it is. But she didn't quite convince him. And so he called in a matron to search her. And he put Emily in this very small room is about eight by eight. There's nothing there other than a desk. And Emily was looking for where could she possibly hide this message? There's no little cubby to put it in. There's nothing secretive. She can't put it in the desk drawer at all. That's going to be discovered. She didn't know what to do with it. but And she knew that when the matron came, her message, the message was going to be discovered. And she had promised General Green that this would not happen. So she felt the only thing that she could do would be to destroy the message. So she memorized it and she ripped it up and she ate it. She swallowed all those little bits of parchment. She swallowed that seal, you know, the wax seal that was with it. She made sure there was nothing for the matron to find. And when the matron came in, there was nothing there. So Emily was then sent on her way, but now she has another problem because she doesn't have that message anymore. So she got to General Sumter's camp and now she had to convince General Sumter that she did indeed have this message from General Green and he needed to meet up with General Green and that this would be an, an ambush. And she did manage to convince him. The, um, the Patriots did have a battle with the British. It was not the outright victory that the Patriots had hoped for, uh, but they were quite successful. They were somewhat successful in what they had done. So the messengers, or the couriers played a very important role at this time. And women often, you know, stepped forward to do that. Another role that I have mentioned is the saboteurs. Now the, the Patriots really wanted the local people to harass the British as much as possible so that they couldn't focus fully on fighting the, the Continental Army. And so they asked them to do anything they could to disrupt the normal role of things that were going on, to interrupt the shipments of supplies if they could do that, to um, interrupt the, the, re the reinforcements coming in, delay them in any way that they could. So two of the women that I have featured in my book are Rachel and Grace Martin, and they lived with their mother-in-law. They had received word that there was a British courier that was going to be passing nearby the mother-in-law's house. And they felt certain that they could find a way to intercept this message that this courier was taking and certainly sabotage the British by doing this. What they were really concerned about is that the message that he was carrying might have some kind of impact on their husbands who were both in the Continental Army. So they devised a plan. They uh, dressed up in their husband's old clothing. It was uh, late at night. They pulled the hats down over them, their faces to disguise themselves. And they intercepted the British messenger and his two guards. They, talked, they ca caught them totally by surprise. The messenger had to give them his dispatch. And then they told the, the messenger and the guards that they needed to turn around and go back from where they came. And then Emil, or, uh, Rachel and Grace then took a shortcut over to the mother-in-law's house. Um, well, they took a side trip first. They, they gave the message to a trusted friend that they, that they knew would get this to the Patriots camp. And then they got to the mother-in-law's house and they were busy celebrating with one another that they had done this when there was a knock on the door. And here stood the British courier and the two guards. And what they were doing was seeking shelter for the night. They wanted the, the Martins to put them up for the night and they promised to leave first thing in the morning. Well, Rachel and Grace were terrified that they had been found out. But as it turned out, um, the courier said, oh no, we were accosted by some rebel lads. Um, they took us by surprise. We didn't know what was going on. And Rachel and Grace feigned sympathy with them 
And the courier and the guards left the next morning, not knowing that these two women were the rebel lads that they had encountered out on the, out on the roadway. Another saboteur was a woman that I mentioned at the beginning of, of this program, and that's, that's uh, Martha Bratton. And as I said, Martha was determined that her husband return home to a successful farm or a successful uh, plantation. But before he left, he put her in charge of a keg of uh, gunpowder because the governor of South Carolina, Governor John Rutledge, had encouraged the Patriots to do all they could to harass the British. And so he had dispersed these different uh, kegs of gunpowder and said, use this as, as you can to harass the, the British as much as possible. Well, Martha's husband had hidden the gunpowder in a hollow tree on their property. And he told Martha about it and said, no matter what, be sure that the British do not get their hands on it because they will use it against us. And Martha found out that one of the Tory neighbors had discovered the gunpowder and had gone to a British officer to tell them about it. So she hurried over to the tree. She broke open the gunpowder. She got a trail of the gunpowder leading away from the tree. And as the British were marching towards the hollow tree to confiscate the gunpowder, she blew it up. Uh, she did admit to the officer because he was going to punish everyone in town. She admitted that she was the one who did it and he didn't believe her because she was a woman. How could she possibly have done that? Um, but she did say that she was responsible for it. She was the only one responsible for it. And so he sentenced her then to, you know, 30 days on your property, you can't leave your property as a result of it. But she continued to uh, find ways to help the Patriots after that and to sabotage as much as possible. So when I was doing the research uh, for my book, one of my goals was that I would create a book that would have information for students that would help them understand that history is more than just dates and battles. But yet I wanted my dates and my battles and all of the information in there to be accurate. I wanted factual information in there, but I wanted the students to understand that history is made up of people and the stories that they have and the circumstances that they've had in their lives. So when I started my research, I was looking for information that would be credible and reliable. Um, I wanted the resources that could stand up to scrutiny. Now, obviously it would be wonderful if I could have primary sources for this. And I did manage to, uh, to obtain some primary sources, but they were written affidavits or journals that I was able to, to read. They were certainly not interviewing anyone in person. Uh, I also wanted to have multiple sources for the information because I wanted to verify it from different points of view as to this is what happened at this particular time. The written information and the primary sources from the people who lived during that time were also um, invaluable to me. So there were affidavits that I was able to find online, uh, journals online, that type of thing. I began just by brick and mortar libraries. Now, I split my time between Wisconsin and Arizona. And when I'm in Wisconsin, it's a very rural part of Wisconsin. The libraries are very small. Uh, yes, I can obtain, you know, information or I, I can obtain books from different libraries, but that does take a little bit of time to do that. But I scoured the libraries for nonfiction to begin with. So I looked for biographies about some of these women. And I also looked at uh, credible authors. And when I was speaking to some historians, several of them said, begin by, by reading the book about women of the American Revolution by Elizabeth Ellett. It was published in 1848. And Elizabeth Ellett managed to interview people who had lived during the time of the American Revolution. And they could be primary, they were primary sources for her book. So I was able to obtain that and I, I read her book. And I also read books by Cokie Roberts, such as The Founding Mothers. And of course, Cokie Roberts was, uh, historian and journalist. And I felt very comfortable that her books would be very credible 
and very reliable. Now, I also looked at a number of online websites. And again, I wanted things that would be reliable and that I could put my, my belief in. So some of the websites that I uh, researched but that I used were the National Women's History Museum, the National Museum of American History, the Smithsonian Institute, um, and then also the online diaries, journals, memoirs, uh, that type of thing. So I was looking for, uh, trying to make sure that the websites that I read were going to be truthful and factual and they would support my information. I also contacted some museums, uh, some by email, some by phone, and some I actually visited in person. When I was talking about Emily Giger, I visited the Casey Historical Museum in uh, Casey, South Carolina. And they had an entire floor dedicated to Emily Giger. And so I was able to see a replica of the room where she was held at that time. I contacted the historical societies with the historians to help me with the details and the dates, wanting to make sure that the information that I had was accurate. Um, I also looked at historical markers and monuments, mostly to check the dates again and the details, the locations, that type of thing, who was there. And I was also very privileged to speak with a descendant of uh, one of the women featured in my book. Her name was Dicey Langston. And I spoke with a descendant who told me the story that was handed down from generation to generation. And I really enjoyed that interview because I got to know a little bit about what the personality of Dicey was like and how she was a very feisty young lady. And uh, that was one of the more enjoyable parts of my research. And certainly there were a number of obstacles and, and there are always a number of obstacles when you do research. Um, the events happened 245, 250 years ago. So, I'm not going to be able to interview anyone who was physically there at the time. I had to rely heavily on written information uh, for my book. Also, the women that I wanted to highlight were little known women. I purposely did not want to have famous women in my book because I wanted to show that ordinary people can do extraordinary things. And so they were not prominent women. And because of that, there were not a lot of books written about them or a lot of articles that were written about them. I had to really dig to, to find the information. And of course, I would always come up with conflicting information. You know, is this date correct? Or is this location correct? And so that is why I, I relied heavily on multiple sources to make sure that I could match things up that I was providing accurate information to my young readers. Uh, the different spellings of the names were interesting to me. For example, Sybil Luddington, S-Y-B-I-L. Her headstone actually says S-I-B-B-E-L-L. -L. Deborah Sampson, sometimes her name is spelled S-A-M-S-O-N, sometimes it's S-A-M-P-S-O-N. And some of that may have to do with the amount of literacy at that time. Um, maybe spelling phonetically is what was encouraged at that time. I'm not really sure. Um, but I did try to verify, yes, this is the same person that I am researching. And then access to the resources. Um, again, because I live in Northwest Wisconsin, a very rural area, I was somewhat limited. Uh, due to location, but I did make a, a trip out, out east. I went to uh, South Carolina, North Carolina, Georgia, Virginia. And so I was able to visit some historical museums that were there, and that helped me quite a bit. Okay, so this is my contact information. I've enjoyed uh, speaking to you this evening, and I'm looking forward to any questions that you might have. Uh, my website is www.kmwaldevogel.com. And my email is simply waldevogelkm 
at gmail.com. So I'm going to stop sharing at this point. Yep. Well, thank okay. you. I mean, what a wonderful way to be celebrating Women's History Month. Yes. Uh, yes. This, this was fascinating and the stories are so interesting. Uh, we do have some questions and one I'd love to ask is, you know, with some of these women, for example, Sybil Luddington, there's a lot of mythology around the stories. How hard was it to discern fact from myth or romance? It's always tempting to, uh, to give in to a lot of the myth that goes along with it. Um, I, I was very comfortable with what I had written about Sybil because I had done a lot of research on her especially you know there there had been several books that had been written about her and with the bibliographies in the back I was very comfortable that um, what I had said about her making this trip at night was truly something that that had occurred now I'm I'm thinking that maybe it was 40 miles maybe not the 40 miles but it was certainly a quite a distance for a, a young woman at that time. Yeah, um, we've had people who I just want to tell you they're very complimentary comments in the in the chat session. Oh, people, thank you. Yeah, um, we have people saying I know how challenging it is to talk to a group of people you can't see. I just wanted to say <laughs> how interesting this is. Thank you. Thoroughly enjoying okay. it. Um, so, well, the fact that you were writing for students, um, how did that impact? your style and, and your decisions about who to write about? You know, it's interesting that, that you say that because I really did want to make this a middle grade book because I, I think that history can be lost at that time. You know, students are not all that interested in it and I wanted them to be involved in the stories. And I did have um, another woman that I had researched quite a bit but no matter how I wrote about her, I wasn't comfortable putting that in a middle grade book. Um, she was certainly very heroic. She was uh, amazing in her actions, but she was also quite brutal. And I was concerned about maybe fourth graders or fifth graders reading about some of the things that she did at this point in their lives. You know, later on, certainly if they're in eighth grade or they're in ninth grade, I would be very comfortable with them reading about it because they would understand that this was under the, the stress of war. But right now, um, to take, you know, sniper type action against people that are walking down the road, um, I just wasn't quite sure that I could include that in my book. Yeah, yeah. Um... One question is, in your research, did you find any portraits or drawings of these women and girls? I did find some. Um, I think of, uh, I'm trying to remember which ones now, but um, I think there were some of um, Deborah Sampson. There were some of uh, Sybil Ludington. I didn't find any of um, Grace or Rachel Martin when I did my research. However, I listened in to um, the Antiquarian Association did, did a presentation and I believe it was Woody Holton who was doing it and he showed like a lithograph of you know the, the women um, holding up the courier and when I saw the lithograph I thought oh that's Grace and Rachel Martin um, but I did not come across that myself but I was interested interested to see that he had come across it. So there had been, you know, a, a few sketches that I had seen, mm -hmm. no real portraits at all, but a few sketches. Did you have a favorite? You know, it's hard to know because uh, I did admire Martha Bratton. And one of the reasons I truly admired her, I didn't even get to at this point, but she had been accosted by uh, some Tories, they they were trying to convince her to convince her husband to join the the loyalists, and she refused. And one of them put a grappling hook up against her neck, and a British officer intervened on her behalf. Well, then 
I think it was two days later, the, there was battles at her neighbors and then it came into Martha's property where the battle continued. And Martha cared for the British, the Tories, the Patriots, anyone who was wounded, she brought into her home and she cared for them. And one of the, the officers who was arrested, who was supposed to be hanged because he was an officer, was the man who had intervened on her behalf. And she went to uh, the Patriots commanding officer and she pled his case and said, I would not be here if it had not been for this man. He saved my life. The least I can do is to save his life. And so they agreed and uh, he became a prisoner of war and then he was exchanged later on for some Patriot prisoners. But I, I truly admired her because I thought for her to treat these men who had been so brutal to her, mm -hmm. um, but she cared for them. Yeah. Um, any other questions from our audience? Well, while we're waiting, um, Having heard about these wonderful active citizens, I do want to tell you that on April 13th, we will be celebrating the active citizenship at Lantern 2022. Um, Michael Bloomberg will be our keynote speaker. And this is a man who, of course, has had a life of, of great success, but also great giving back. And um, we're very much looking forward to it. Tickets are available on our website. And if you're at a distance, that's okay because it's going to be streamed and there are virtual seats, infinite number of virtual seats available. So we do hope that we'll see some of you um, in the audience that night because it really will be something. The, I believe, yes, we have put the link in the chat. So... I do see that some folks, and it may be that some folks got confused because of the time difference or just joining now, because I know Kathleen, your friends may be out in the Midwest. Um, please just urge them to contact me and I'll make the recording available to them. Uh, anyway, everyone is saying thank you. Very interesting. Greatly appreciate your researching these women and these histories are so underrepresented. And we agree with you. We think that the key to telling history is to tell inclusive history. It's all of our history. So thank you very much for your part in, in sharing stories that have been, I don't know, left behind a little bit, but you brought them forward. So yeah, thank you very much for having me. Yeah, it's a pleasure. So thanks, everyone. Have a good night. And thank you again for joining us.